most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. This is the Gospel Hour, making known to this nation the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for today's message that was preached and recorded by the founder of the Gospel Hour, Evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. And now, here with our message, Oliver B. Green. Heavenly Father, as we study thy word today, direct us for Jesus' sake. Whatever happens in Radio Land, we'll give God the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in the last part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus sends out a solemn warning. Beware of false prophets. Beware of false prophets. Then he says in verse 21, Not everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the, my, the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now, the will of God the Father, according to John chapter 6, is that we believe on his Son, Jesus Christ. God's will for our life is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In, in another place, and I'll show it to you a little bit later in the series, but another place, the Pharisees ask Jesus, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? We want to work the works of God. Now, what must we do? And Jesus said, believe on the Son that he hath sent. Believe on the Son if you want to work the works of God. Now, let me hurry on because I do want to move on hurriedly because I have a lot to say in the rest of the days of the month. Not everyone, verse 21, not everyone saith, Lord, Lord, but he that doeth the will. Now, in verse 22, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name we've cast out devils. And in thy name we've done many wonderful works. And then, verse 23, Jesus said, I will profess unto them that I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, I urged you to note, and I urged you to pay close attention that these verses do not describe a group of preachers and religious workers who had salvation and were in the grace of God and lost their salvation and fell from grace. Now, those verses do not teach that. Now, why do I say that so dogmatically? Because Jesus said, I never knew you. I never did know you. I never met you. You say you prophesied in my name, you cast out devils in my name, you did many wonderful works in my name, but I don't know you, I've never known you, never did know you, I never knew you. Depart, ye that work iniquity. So you see, beloved, if it were possible, the devil would deceive the very elect of God. Now, the devil's determined to send folks to hell, and if he can send them to hell through the avenue of deception, then he'll send them there through deception. And he is the master of all counterfeiters. And he'll give you a counterfeit religion if he can. And don't you ever forget the devil has power. And the devil is no ordinary personality. He's extraordinary. But I'm glad that God is almighty and God can give victory over them. Now these people prophesied. They preached. They cast out devils. They did wonderful works. But they were never born again. They were never saved. They never received Jesus as their Savior. Now, in the last verses, and I must just refer to these and then we'll move on, Jesus said that a man who heareth the sayings of Jesus, that is, if we hear the gospel of Jesus and do the things we hear, we are like a wise man, we're building on a rock, but if we hear the sayings and refuse to do them, we're like a foolish man that built his house on the sand. Now, the rains came, the floods came, and the house fell, and great was the fall. Now, when Jesus ended his teaching in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Bible says the people were astonished at his doctrine. The people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Don't you see? He taught them as one having authority, certainly, he not only taught the gospel, he was the gospel. He not only taught the word of God, he was the word of God. And so if that be true, let us hear the teachings of Jesus. Now let me say this before I leave the Sermon on the Mount. 
the people, the masses, were astonished at his doctrine. Now, let me tell you something. You go in the pulpit today and talk about a hell where fire and brimstone is burning and where souls are weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth. You go in the pulpit today and talk about Jesus Christ coming back to this earth personally in a body. You go in the pulpit today and talk about the heavens passing away with a great noise and the elements melting with fervent heat, the world and the works being burned up. You go in the pulpit today and talk about an old-fashioned mourner's bench, repentance, blood-bought salvation, and people are still astonished at your doctrine. Now, I know what I'm talking about. I've been in the ministry long enough to learn a few things from the experiences that I've had. So Jesus taught with authority, and he taught such a gospel, and he preached such a gospel that the people were astonished. They were dumbfounded, and they couldn't understand. Now, I want us to go on and see just what the Lord Jesus Christ preached. And I know no gospel better to refer to than the gospel of John. Now, it would be utterly impossible for us to read every word that Jesus spoke, every sermon that Jesus delivered, and to read all the verses in the New Testament that has to do with the teaching of Jesus. But we can hit high places. Now, Jesus enters his public ministry in the Gospel of John, and he goes down to Cain of Galilee, and he attends a marriage. Then he goes in the temple, and verse 13, the Jews' Passover was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, that is, he made a whip, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the changers money and over through the tables. My, mm, my, my, my. I tell you, brother, I tell you, I wish, that some of our educated, sophisticated modernists would preach a sermon on verses 13 through 25 of John chapter 2. Now, I don't say that with a hateful spirit. I'm not saying it sarcastically, but I'd like to hear their message on this gospel of Jesus. The Son of God went in the house of God and found a gang in there selling and changing money. Listen, I know what they were doing. I, I'm, I'm aware. Now, listen. In that day they offered sacrifices, and they were selling doves and pigeons and oxen and sheep. And uh, when the people came in from another country, they had to change their money into the currency of Jerusalem, so they were money changers. In other words, they were making merchandise out of people, and they turned the house of God into a place of merchandise. And they were selling sacrifices, and they were changing money and it looked like an auction sale when the Son of God walked in there. What did he do? He took some cords. He made a whip. He ran the animals out. He chased the people out. And bless your soul, he turned over the tables with the money spread out on them. Now, what did he say? He said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Now listen, I've said on the radio, I say it tenderly, I say it lovingly, God knows, God knows. I say it from the bottom of a sincere heart that loves God and loves the church. But beloved friends, listen, we've brought entirely too much of the world in the church today, and there's too much feeding and too much entertaining and too much training of bodies and too little fervent spirit praying and begging God for revival in the souls of men. I'm not a fanatic. I'm not a religious crackpot. I know that if we do not take care of the recreational part of our young people, and if we do not give them a wholesome recreation, the devil will give them the wrong kind. I know that. But, beloved, we have restaurants and cafeterias that have rooms where you can take your Sunday school class, you can take your uh, societies, and you can go to those restaurants or to those cafeterias, and you can have your, uh, your class meeting or your church meeting, and if you want to have a supper, you can go in there and discuss your problems and eat your meal. We have cafeterias for that. We have places to entertain. We have all those things. But, beloved, the tragedy of this hour 
the church is being turned into a recreation center and a serving center and a feeding center. And bless your heart, there's not very much emphasis put on people's souls getting right with God as did Nicodemus. And I'll tell you about him in just a few minutes. All right. So Jesus said, you've made my house a house of merchandise. In other words, you've gone in business. And I'm going to tell you, religion's becoming big business in America. That's right. You might as well face it. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Uh, then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou uh, unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? In other words, what authority do you have to run these animals out here and kick these tables or push these tables over? Then said the Jew, uh, Jesus, verse 19, answered, unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Now he said, I'll prove to you who I am. Destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. Now he was talking about the temple of his body, but they misunderstood. They said, 46 years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. You see, they were, they were religious authorities, but they were ignorant. They didn't understand one single solitary thing about Jesus Christ coming. Isaiah said, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, chastisement of our peace was born with stripes were healed. In other words, the Old Testament prophesied the sufferings of Jesus before the crown, the cross before the crown, that he would be rejected before he would be received. But these religious authorities and these religious men didn't understand one single solitary thing about it. Not one thing. All right. So, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men, and he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, I've read that passage, verses 13 through 25 today, to show you what the Son of God thinks about making merchandise out of the house of God. Now, I'm for the church, I love the church, I'm a member of the church, I belong to the church, I'm going to stay in the church, I'm not going to take my letter out and put it in the trunk. There are not enough hypocrites in the country to run me out of the church and run my church letter in a trunk or put it away in a cabinet someplace. I'm going to keep my membership in the church just as long as I stay on this earth. I'm a member of the true church, the body of Christ, the born again, I've been saved by grace. But the Bible says, fail not the assembling of yourselves together, and I believe we ought to assemble with the brethren. There'll be some tares in the group. There'll be some Pharisees and hypocrites. Yes, but that shouldn't stop us from assembling. Now, Jesus said, my house shall be a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves and merchandise. In other words, you're buying, you're selling, you've gone in business, and you're not using my house for what my house was built for. And so he chased them out, he ran them out, and he told them that he would, that is, when they destroyed that temple, in other words, he knew they'd crucify him, and he said, I'll raise it up in three days. Now then, so far as I know, the third chapter of the Gospel of John, so far as I know, and so far as I can detect, this chapter records the first real personal evangelism that Jesus conducted. Now, I know in chapter 1, he calls the, the fellows here, the disciples, but Nicodemus is a Pharisee. And so, in chapter 3 of John's Gospel, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, who of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Now, beloved, here in these seven verses we have the gospel of Jesus Christ concerning entering the kingdom of God. Now, wait a minute. Beloved, wait a minute. Dear sister, dear brother, my friend, listen to me. If the words of Jesus Christ are final, if the Bible is the word of God, and if the gospel of Jesus Christ is the authority in this day of grace, then I say in the name of common sense, let us hear what John 3 has to say. Let us search the teaching of Jesus in John 3, and God help you and God help me to ask ourselves, have I been born again? Now, if I haven't, I'm on the road to hell. I don't care how much I preach. I don't care how much I evangelize. I don't care how much I pray. I don't care how much I give. I don't care how loyal I am to the church. I don't care how loyal I am to the program. It doesn't make any difference. If I'm not born again, I'll burn in the pit when I die. Now, wait a minute. I want to ask you, my precious brother, my precious sister, my precious friend, my dear neighbor, young man, young woman, church member, non-church member, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Holiness, Catholic, Lutheran, Episcopalian, whatever you are, it makes no difference. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, that's settled. That's settled. And it's settled by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not critical. Please do not mark me down as a fault finder and a religious critic. I'm not. I'm not. Now, when Jesus met Nicodemus, why didn't he shake his hand and say, go on down and be faithful to the temple and put your offerings in the plate and attend the feast and the rituals and the services and be loyal and that's all you need? Why didn't he say that? He said he didn't say that because that is not all Nicodemus needed. And that's not all that you need. And that's not all that I need. And that's not all that any poor sinner needs. Every dear sinner listening to my voice, regardless of who you are, if you hope to step inside the pearly gates, and if you hope to be in that number when the saints go marching in, you must be born of the Spirit of God. You must be born from above. You must be born again. Now on tomorrow's broadcast... I'm going to show you as plain as the nose on your face in the mirror. When you look in the mirror, you don't have any trouble seeing the nose on your face. You don't have any trouble seeing your eyes. There they are, right there in the mirror. There's your nose. There's your mouth. There's your face. I'm going to show you tomorrow on the radio just plain as your face in the mirror how we are born again. So don't miss it. The Son of God said, if you're not born again, you'll burn in the pit. The Son of God said, if you're not born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. You won't enter the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you must, you must be born again. Are you born again? God help you to ask yourself that question. Father, take this message and use it to the glory of our God in whose name we've sent it out. Save the soul, our Father, that's nearest hell today. And we'll give God the praise in Jesus' precious name we ask it, and for his sake. Amen.